more organizations are creating spaces for these conversations to happen about racial inequity. And we're just hoping that we can continue to do this work alongside with them. That's the voice of Shalanda Spencer, Executive Director at WCATS. She and Meher Akrami, the Orgs and Solidarity Project Lead, are today's guests on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Summer is finally here. Tom, did you stay cool this weekend? Hey, Michelle. Uh, Yes, I did. I'm actually now in New Hampshire, which is a tremendously nice place to be. When it's hot, it's probably about as hot as it is where you are, quite frankly, about 90 degrees. But there's a lake nearby, so you can always hop in the lake and cool off. How was your weekend? Oh, it was warm, but not as warm as our friends in the Pacific Northwest. Climate change, you know, big challenge. But getting into this week's nuclear news, what do you have lined up for us on early warning today? Well, Michelle, there's a lot going on with Iran. The Biden administration conducted military strikes against Iranian-backed targets in Iraq and Syria over the weekend, which could, of course, affect the ongoing talks in Vienna to revive the nuclear deal. Uh, Too soon to tell. On early warning, we will focus on the recent elections and Iran's new president, Ibrahim Raisi. He is a hardliner and bad news for democracy, but he might be good news for the Iran deal. So please stay tuned. And after that, I sit down with Shalonda Spencer, the executive director at Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security and Conflict Transformation, and her colleague, Meher Akrami, the program lead at WCAPS, where they both focus on the development and implementation of the organization's In Solidarity initiative. They share with us their passion of their fight for social justice and their work to end racial disparities. And we hear from them what commitment it takes to truly advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in peace and security organizations. Their new baseline report shines a light on the challenges facing our field and tell us more about how you can get involved. So please stay tuned. And as usual, if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps to grow our show and our audience, and we always appreciate it. But with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dell. The votes are in and conservative chief justice Ibrahim Raisi will be the next president of Iran. This was reportedly a low turnout election where the candidates were handpicked by the supreme leader. And this is the outcome that the hardliners wanted. Uh, But in a strange turn of events, uh, what is bad for democracy in Iran may turn out to be good for the Iran nuclear deal. As our listeners know, the Biden administration has been holding indirect talks with Iran in Vienna for weeks, and by many accounts, those talks are closed to a conclusion. Uh, The key decisions left must be made at the highest political levels. Here to help us understand how all of this may play out is Ali Vaez. He directs the Iran Project at the International Crisis Group, and he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and recently had an op-ed published in the New York Times with his colleague Dina Esfandieri titled, The Hardliners Won in Iran, That's Not All Bad News. Ali, great to have you. Great to be here, Tom. Thank you. First, tell us, what do we know about incoming President Raisi? Mr. Raisi is currently the chief of Iran's judiciary. He's 60. He's a disciple of uh, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, he's a tested and loyal ally of him and was, as you said, handpicked really by the Guardian Council, uh, which itself is uh, completely aligned with the Supreme Leader uh, by disqualifying anyone who posed a serious threat to Mr. Raisi in this election. Uh, we don't know much about his foreign policy views. Uh, he's a novice uh, in that area. Uh, but we can have a good guess that he's probably going to reflect uh, the, the views of the Supreme Leader. Uh, he was implicated in uh, mass executions of political dissidents in the late 1980s and has been obviously involved uh, as someone who spent his lifetime in the judiciary in 
uh, uh, human rights violations uh, in Iran and therefore uh, I, I would say has a notorious reputation uh, both inside Iran and outside of the country. Thanks. Now, as as we know, this power shift in Iran comes at a pivotal time for the nuclear talks. So what effect would this election have on the efforts to revive the nuclear deal? Well, the effect that it has had so far is that I think it delayed the breakthrough because uh, the deep state in Iran, the Supreme Leader's office and the Revolutionary Guards, uh, they didn't want a diplomatic breakthrough in Vienna uh, to have any kind of electoral implications in Iran. Uh, and uh, so that's why the talks took longer uh, than, than many expected initially. At this point, however, I don't think it's going to make much difference because at the end of the day, uh, those who would have to give the green light to Iranian negotiators to demonstrate f- flexibility haven't changed. That's the Supreme Leader uh, and the people around him. Uh, and Iranian negotiating team is uh, not going to change even when President Raisi comes to office. Uh, that's what he has he has promised uh, to do, to keep the current uh, Iranian negotiators. My understanding is that he has uh, already been briefed by Iranian negotiators and uh, Iranian foreign minister about the details of these negotiations. I think he knew the big picture because he's a member of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, which is in charge of devising Iran's uh, nuclear strategy and, and negotiating tactics. Uh, but, uh, but I think he has received more details. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next round of negotiations, one of his representatives would attend as an observer uh, on the Iranian side. Uh, but all in all, in the short run, I, I don't think uh, Iran's uh, negotiating tactics are going to change much. Now, what uh, is critical here is that my sense is that the Supreme Leader and Mr. Raisi himself, probably have a preference that the deal is restored before Raisi comes to office. This is because by now they know what it takes to restore the deal is painful compromises. The the Iranians are not going to get 100% sanctions relief or uh, get everything they wanted. Uh, And so why not have Rouhani who they blame for negotiating uh, a uh, one-sided, flawed nuclear agreement to begin with, restore the deal on his way out of the presidential palace so that Raisi can come in without the burden of blame, only to reap the economic dividends of sanctions relief. Last question for you. A key issue for some is what will happen after the Iran deal is revived, uh, including follow-on talks to, quote, lengthen and strengthen the deal. Uh, What are your expectations for how this election outcome will affect follow-on talks, if any? So currently, the U.S. negotiators in Vienna have asked the Iranians uh, to commit to a follow-on negotiation as part of uh, these ongoing discussions in Vienna and as part of uh, any agreement that would emerge uh, as a result of uh, the current diplomatic track. The Iranians have so far refused. Um, and uh, it's hard to imagine that, uh, you know, uh, that at the end of the day, that President Raisi would be willing to show flexibility where even the Rani ad- administration shied away from it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if the deal, um, let me say it this way, if a follow on negotiation is uh, described as more for more or better for better, Uh, At the end of the day, I think that is in the interest of Iran, because remember, even in 2016, the Iranians were unhappy with the amount of sanctions relief that they received uh, when the JCPOA was being fully implemented by the United States. They also have other demands that they could put on the table. For instance, they uh, have talked about compensation as a result of the damages that the Trump administration's maximum pressure strategy has inflicted on Iran. Uh, so these could all include uh, be included in a follow-on negotiation. Um, now, my sense is uh, that um, uh, in a counterintuitive way, uh, the fact that hardliners are now in control of all levers of power in Iran could help with a follow-on negotiation because the, the two elements that uh, bug down the Rouhani administration uh, throughout JCPOA negotiations which was infighting inside Iran uh, and also mistrust towards Iranian negotiators 
uh, are not going to be issues that Rouhani, uh, that Raisi's uh, negotiators would have to deal with. Uh, they are from the deep states. They represent the deep states. Uh, and the deep state is in control of everything in Iran. So uh, this, uh, I think, would help. But in many ways, Raisi's administration is a double-edged sword in the sense that um, it, the hardliners are uh, much better placed and have a stronger muscle to deliver and follow through on any negotiations with the United States. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, they are not as adept as, uh, at, at negotiations uh, as the more moderate forces of Iranian politics are. And the cost, especially the political cost of dealing with them is higher uh, for the Biden administration, especially given Mr. Raisi's uh, really uh, horrible human rights record. Thank you for that. And Ali, sadly, we are out of time, but I want to thank you so much for being on the show and best of luck to you and all your work. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner, and I'm the managing director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate. If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. Orgs in Solidarity is a partnership among more than 300 organizations and individuals who are signatories to the Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation United States or United Kingdom Standing Together Against Racism and Discrimination Statements. Today, I am excited to welcome to the show Shalonda Spencer, Executive Director of WCAPS, and Meher Akrami. Orgs and Solidarity Project Lead. Shalanda comes to WCAPS with a deep expertise in policy, advocacy, and education. Among her many roles, she previously held the position of Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Trying Together in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and served as a legislative assistant for the U.S. House of Representatives for the 2nd Congressional District of Mississippi, and as a foreign policy analyst for the Mennonite Central Committee. Meher was most recently a Herbert Scoville Jr. Peace Fellow and is a published fiction writer. Shalanda, Meher, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here. So Orgs and Solidarity is now one year old. It comes on the heels of the somber anniversaries of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony Dade, and Ahmed Arbery, whose deaths sparked, as you said in a recent reflection statement, could no longer ignore the vast inequities that exist in this country. First of all, congratulations on reaching this milestone. You built a community in the wake of immense grief, questioning, and growth. And as we've discussed before, change takes time. So what have you seen over the past year? So there is, with anything like this, a lot of good and some bad. Um, and I am a firm believer in being honest and straightforward. So over the last year, we've seen a lot of organizations and individuals step forward and put in a lot of effort into making change, change that clearly never really occurred to folks before because they didn't see the problems. They do now. And lots of organizations and individuals are working very hard on changing the way they work, the way the fields work, and the way they approach these issues. It's not somebody else's problem. It is now our problem, which is good because obviously these aren't going to be fixed overnight. 
And if they were going to be fixed quickly, they already would have been. But on the other side, we've also seen that a year is a long time to sustain effort on these issues. A year is a long time for organizations and individuals who are oftentimes not directly impacted by racism or white supremacy, or rather don't see how they're directly impacted because they are, we all are. It's a long time for them to sustain their effort whenever they're being pulled in a hundred directions and their resources are limited. So the reality is that we have hit the point where those people who are really dedicated are still dedicated. And those people who maybe don't have as much of a direct personal connection to this work are starting to peel off. And we're hoping to find a way to resolve these two things into a continued dedication from not just those who are interested. And I want to be clear, there are a lot of folks who are still interested in this work. But the reality is that entropy is taking hold in a lot of ways. People are burning out because it's hard to always be trying to work on these issues. And a lot of folks are losing interest. And I, I, I will say that that's not just within our field. That's across the country. We can all see this. We've all seen this. So something that we've been trying to do at this to mark this one year is to note that we have to redouble our efforts. We have to stay engaged because one year doesn't fix these problems. One year makes organizations better. One year makes individuals better. But it does not change fields. It does not change systems. For me, I will have to say um, after a year and after a year of, the, of WCAPs acknowledging this kind of work, but since I've been in my position and being able to meet with a lot of these organizations, what I've seen was organizations having to be honest with themselves as far as work culture, the racial discrimination or issues that they may have that they don't see inside of their work environment. And I see a lot of conflict transformation happening, whether if it's in within leadership or just overall creating a space to where you can have these deep dive conversations on what does racial injustice looks like inside of the workspace. You know, if people who have watched our video on YouTube and you heard some of the testimonial stories that this this stuff takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. But most of all, it really takes honesty because you have people who have to face like what does this look like for me as a black person in this space? Am I always having to explain myself in my work environment as to like how I feel being black? And then how do my white counterpart or any other ethnicity take me and my response to situations that are happening? Am I coming off too offensive? It's like people are always having to wash their backs. And it's like now um, more organizations are creating spaces for these conversations to happen about racial inequity. And we're just hoping that we can continue to do this work alongside with them. One of the things I've really appreciated about Orgs and Solidarity is that you took this statement, which started with 12 commitments to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and combat racism. And you've turned it into not just a, a community, but you've also surveyed everyone in the community to help take out the actual data. Um, Marina Robinson Snowden talked in her piece in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists about how we can't rely on anecdotes. You can't really expect to that by asking people to relive their trauma um, in order for you to design interventions that you are going to really make a difference. And I think one of the things Orgs and Solidarity has done is you, you've created this actual baseline report, the first of its kind, that compiles the results of the survey of what the demographics look like across organizations in the field. So bravo. And what were the biggest takeaways for you all in putting that report together? Well, for one, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> that's a takeaway. Um, but, but seriously, um, Something that's interesting that really was underlined by this report is that a lot of organizations thought about these issues and had an approach to these issues, but not a lot of organizations had an approach that worked. Partially, I think, because a lot of organizations have things like a DEI statement, but it's a statement that they made and it's over there. 
and they don't really have to look at it on a day-to-day basis, but they made it and that's good. But whenever you actually look at the, the statistics of what organizations, like how they're made up, there still are not people of color in leadership positions. There really are not that many people of color in organizations in these fields if you actually look at the statistical breakdown. So when you look at organizations having these mechanisms and then you actually look at the reality of the way the organization is built, you can really see that like the two things don't necessarily connect, that there really has to be a direct engagement from the people in the organizations, in the work to make these changes for the changes to happen. So that's one thing that's like really underlined by this. Uh, Another one really quickly is that we also asked the organizations and individuals who took the survey, which of the 12 commitments they thought would be the most challenging. And it's actually really interesting because some of the ones they singled out as the most challenging seem like they would not be. (laughs) Because if you look at like the number one most challenging was uh, hiring individuals from local and low income communities. Which is like, yeah, that's that's not easy. None of these are easy. But that's something that is like within your organization. You can change systems. You can make systems that will allow for this. But when you look at something like actively changing the face of international peace and security by ensuring that our organizations represent the diversity of our country at all levels, that's big. But it wasn't number one, which is really interesting to me. It's uh, something that's sort of, is striking about the way people see their organizations and because they can visualize that more. The report is out. You can find it. You can read it. We obviously anonymized it. We don't want organizations to be on the spot for every piece of it. Um, but so the, the anecdotes are, are really honest. Some of them were really striking. For example, we asked how discrimination is handled within organizations. And one of the answers was literally The blatant is punished, the subtle is ignored. The honesty of that is powerful and really useful. Um, So yeah, that's that's some of the sort of top line stuff that I took away from. Shalanda, I'm curious for you, you know, coming into this field and having worked on these issues across different fields, whether there was anything for you that was particularly unique or in some ways, you know, not unique. So some of the unique things that I've seen for me is being able to, I think, manage all of these organizations that come from different cultures, different environments, and being able to bring them together. Just the other day, we were on a video call, and it was amazing to see how um, someone who created this amazing surveys of like, how are you promoted in your work environment? What are some of the things that your leadership do? Are you acknowledged and stuff like that? And I think surveys like those are great because it gives the employers as well as the employees something to think about that they don't often think about when it comes to how you're treating your employees. Are they feeling gratitude in their workspaces? Are they feeling appreciated? And it also drives the racial inequity piece is because just because someone looks like me or in the same space as me does not mean the equitable opportunities are there for me. And so with creating surveys like that and having people on the ground working in those, I feel like, you know, as orgs and solidarity continue to grow um, and continue to have more opportunities where we can build more bridges with other organizations. I think that this is just the beginning and I'm hoping that in the future we can continue these kind of conversations. And on that note, Shalanda, my question for you is, you know, what is your vision for WCAPS? Where do you want to take this really vibrant network over the next year? So we are actually still in our strategy stages. Um, I have, for some reason, since I've been here, I've been keeping this number five in my head. And I'm like, I can't wait to see where I take WCAP for the next five years. Where are we going to go? What are some of the things we're going to do? And it's because um, giving honor to Ambassador Jenkins, who created this amazing work space and amazing organization for women of color in the field of international peace and security, I can't help but to say like, for one, I have some big shoes to fill. (laughs) And for two, I want to see, you know, us 
connect domestic issues within international policy and across the globe. Because, you know, we have chapters in other countries like UK and Canada and Colombia and all those type of things. And there is an intersectionality of all these issues. There is a connection. And one thing I want to do, one of my biggest visions is to intersect those and bring and network with women who are on the ground fighting on these issues that we don't often think about. Um, There are other communities, even in the states, you know, we go to Houston, Texas, we go to Atlanta, the major cities, but there are other cities inside of these bigger states that are not getting exposed to the work that they're doing on the ground. And I think those things are important for us to be able to see because we have women of color from, you know, vast majority of different cultures. And I feel like they can have a lot to bring to WCAPS. And also I would like to increase my, one of my visions is making sure we increase the amount of women of color in the international field space. Right now, women of color only make up 34% of the population when it comes to government employment and just in the field overall. And I keep saying, I want to see that number at 50% soon. Like, I don't know how we're going to do it at WCAPS, but 34 is very low. And I can only assure like it's low for if you break down the ethnicities, I can only imagine where black women stand um, in that space. And so that's one of my biggest visions for WCAPS. And I just hope that we can continue the work and the legacy that Ambassador Jink has created and it's onward and upward. (laughs) And Maher, what comes next for Orgs and Solidarity? Uh, So first, I I really need to uh, follow on with on Shalanda's point about thanking Ambassador Jenkins, because honestly, uh, Orgs and Solidarity would not exist. It wouldn't even be a concept without Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. She is the mind behind it and really has been a brilliant leader overall. And frankly, uh, gave me the chance to work on it and I wouldn't be here without her. So yeah, I, uh, I just want to underline that very much so. Um, next for in Solidarity. So year one for us was very much about looking at the problem, thinking about approaches to it and making sure that we had our ducks straight, basically. Um, year one was planning. Year one was building working groups that could work on all 12 of the commitments and year two for us is very much about starting to take action starting to begin the processes that we see as means to work toward those ideals the 12 commitments obviously are not destinations necessarily because most of them are ideals they're they're where we would like to be but we know where we are (laughs) so year two is about working toward those uh bringing on folks who can help the working groups produce some of their projects. Um, We have 12 working groups. They all have projects in mind. For example, uh, confronting racism and white supremacy. They are going to be working on some definitions because frankly, our field lacks solid definitions for some of these terms that are non-political. There are political definitions for white supremacy, but whenever you're working in an academic space or a policy space, having a shared definition is a very important thing. And that's so that's something that they're working on that will help them going forward because they're very focused on having these conversations because ultimately they realize that making progress towards confronting those requires us to talk about them on an active basis. We have 13 work groups in total. So this next year is about facilitating that work. It's about continuing this momentum. It's about bringing in new folks and it's about getting the folks who are here to stay with us. Because as I mentioned earlier, a year is a long time, but it's going to take a lot longer to change this. So we are consolidating efforts, continuing the collaboration, and starting to make progress towards those goals. And on that note about bringing new people in, where can our listeners go to join WCAPS and Orgs in Solidarity? So for WCAPS, you can go onto our website at www.wcaps.org and you can sign up to be a member. It is free and it's going to be on our homepage of our website. And you can also continue to look at our events page. We have a lot of events that happens throughout the month and there are great conversations with awesome women of color who are in this work. 
And for Orgs and Solidarity, you can go to www.orgsandsolidarity.com or .org. We have both of them. And that will take you to our webpage where you can see, uh, one, you can see the report we talked about earlier. You can see a reflection from the 25th of May. You can see all sorts of things. You can also learn about the 13 working groups and everything else. And in the top right corner, there is a stand with us button, which takes you to the form to sign up and join. And it is as simple as that, but also not as simple as that because we ask for commitment. It's not about signing a piece of paper. It's about committing to work with us and bring that change. Well, on that note, Shalanda, Meher, happy Juneteenth. And thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having us. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Alex Hall, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.